This is the Creality Ender 3. It's actually the first Ender 3 I got my hands on back in 2018. Now when I first got this machine, there was a few issues that I had to work through. Creality was just learning the ropes, but it's fair to say since the launch of the Ender 3, it's probably become one of the most popular 3D printers in the world right now. To be able to buy a 3D printer like this for $200 US is insanely affordable and accessible and it's allowed 3D printing to become so much more widespread, which is fantastic. Unfortunately, just like every other 3D printer, the more you use them, the more they start to get a bit looser, they start to wear out and they can start to break down. Because just like a car, 3D printers require regular maintenance and this machine after a few years of use is starting to show a few signs of wear and tear. So I thought it'd be fun to show you a video of how I actually maintain my 3D printers and walk you through the things you need to look out for to keep your machine safe and accurate for many hundreds of hours of 3D printing in the future. Let's get started. How's it going guys? Angus here from Makers Muse. And as I said, this is a Creality Ender 3. It's the first one I got in 2018. And look, this machine is so insanely popular. I don't need to tell you that there are hundreds of videos on YouTube right now showing you how to maintain and upgrade these machines. And I'm definitely not the first person to do it. However, I have been repairing and maintaining 3D printers for many, many years now. And there's a certain checklist I go through when I take the machine out of the printing room and go through it to refurbish it, to get it up and running almost as good, or if not better than when I first bought it. And this checklist isn't just for the Ender 3, it's for any filament based 3D printer, but I will be focusing on the V roller style design of the Ender 3, which is also used in like the CR10 and many other popular 3D printers right now. So let's go through these seven things I look for. Number one is loose belts. These belts will start to loosen up over time. They stretch, they degrade, and they do need replacing or at least tensioning fairly often during the printer's lifespan. And number two is to look for worn moving components. These machines move for hundreds and hundreds of hours, sometimes thousands of hours if they're used in a print farm and those moving components do wear out. This machine, as I said, uses the V roller and V slot approach and these rollers are soft plastic on aluminum extrusion. So they start to wear out and might need tensioning or even completely replacing, which we might have to do on this machine. And number three is a really big safety concern and that is fraying or broken wires. This is something you should always be keeping an eye out for on 3D printers because again, they're moving all the time and these wires as they move, if they don't have the proper strain relief can start to fray, break, buckle. And if you get a broken wire, it can be catastrophic depending on which wire breaks. Number four is dust and debris. These 3D printers over time get dusty. They start to fill up with bits of 3D print, you know, it's all through the slots here. And also the feeder gear can start filling up with bits of filament dust if it's stripped. And in addition to these things, just making the printer look ugly and dirty, it can also contribute to printing inaccuracies as well. So that's something we're gonna tackle on this machine too. And number five isn't so much an issue of my machine, but that's a clogged or semi-clogged nozzle. Also a nozzle might be flogged out from printing abrasive filaments. And that's something you should also consider replacing when you do your maintenance. And then something specific to the PTFE lined hot ends like this machine has is the PTFE degrading over time. It's something you might have to consider replacing during your maintenance. And then number seven is the fun stuff upgrades. Now this machine isn't stock. I've already done a few things to it to make it print even better than it printed from factory. But when you have the machine apart and you're working on it, it's a perfect time to consider flashing new firmware, doing a few upgrades, printing some upgrades, or even buying some upgrades like a better nozzle or a better feeder gear or a better hot end, all these sort of things you can add to your machine to make it even better than when it started. To work on your printer, you'll need some basic tools. Now, most 3D printers come with tools, but they tend to be really crap. So I recommend using some slightly decent quality tools. You don't have to go this crazy, but I've got a T-handle Allen key here and some wrenches. You also need a cheap flathead screwdriver, which we'll be using to tension the belts. If you intend to lubricate any movie components, you'll also need some grease. I really like this Nulon grease, which I've had for like 10 years. This tub lasts literally forever. And if you intend to upgrade or replace any parts, you'll obviously need those. And if you intend to upgrade or fix any wiring, you will need a soldering iron, side cutters, and probably some heat shrink or electrical tape. I didn't have to do that with my machine, but it's something to keep in mind. You might come across something that needs repair. You need to make sure the machine has no filament loaded before we start doing any maintenance. And I sometimes leave my machines like this with just a bit of filament snapped off in them. It's bad practice, I know. So if your machine has some filament, just warm it up 
and then do your standard extrusion and withdraw procedure. So that means you would just want to push down the filament a little bit so it extrudes a tiny bit and then pull it out. And then for safety reasons, once that is done, make sure the hot end cools completely before you do any additional maintenance. So this is my method for tensioning belts easily on an Ender 3. Each axis has some screws that lock the idler wheel in place and it's adjusting this idler that lets you tension the belts. So what you wanna do is loosen those screws in the axis you're adjusting and don't loosen them too much, just enough so it can move. And what we're going to do is use that flathead screwdriver as a lever to gently and accurately add tension in and then tighten up those screws. So what you do is you put it in place gently between the extrusion and the washers of the idler pulley and then lever it so it moves further away, being very careful that it stays level with the extrusion, doesn't get bent up or down out of place, and then tighten up those screws. So you just tighten up one, then make sure it's in the right place, and then tighten up the other to lock it completely. Now you do have to make sure that when you do this, the little nuts that are used to tighten up under the V-slot extrusion do actually engage with it, otherwise you'll only have one screw holding the idler in place, it won't be good enough. So just keep an eye on the side and then check your tension by moving the axis back and forth. Now, if you do notice this happening where the belt will migrate to one side or the other of the idler pulley, it means that it's not completely square with the frame. It means it's slightly bent in or out and it's bent in on the side that the belt is pulling closer to. So again, get your flathead screwdriver and you want to lever it a little bit using, you have to use a fair bit of force, but only little bits at a time to try to make sure that that idler pulley is perfectly squared with the frame. So when you move the axis back and forth, it doesn't bunch up onto one side. You don't have to go ridiculous with this. The belt shouldn't be ridiculously tight because it will just damage it even faster, but it should be taut and it should be zero slop in the mechanism. And then when you're done with that, you can work through the other axes to get them nice and tight. Now it's time to maintain the motion components. In my machine, the V-rollers have a lot of dust on them, which I need to clean off. But keep in mind, a lot of this dust is actually just from the environment. They get squished out the side of the rollers as the machine moves and it settles there. But some of that is from the plastic of the V-roller itself. And that means they can degrade and weaken over time. So what you want to do is thoroughly clean the dust off and also clean the V slot extrusion itself because if there's crap on the slot, as the rollers roll over them, there will be bumps and these will translate into artifacts on your 3D print. Now for my machine, I did notice there's actually a few spots where the extruder seemed to catch. And I suspected that the V roller actually had flat spots, but after cleaning carefully with some isopropyl alcohol and some paper towels, all the debris and dust off the rollers and slot, I did actually find it cleared up. While you're wiping down your rollers, you also might want to wipe down the rest of the machine. And again, I just used some isopropyl alcohol with some paper towels and I tipped the machine upside down a few times to remove some of the filament just debris that is gathered up in the slots. You can take a vacuum to it, depends how dirty or dusty your machine is. Just make sure that you clean it enough that the motion components aren't at risk of getting dust and debris sucked and pushed into them, which will definitely affect your print quality. Let's say for the sake of the video, I do need to replace one of the V rollers. So make sure you have one on hand. And what you need to do is loosen up the tension so it's no longer hugging the V slot. You'll need to raise the gantry to get underneath it, but get your wrench and rotate that nut so the idler becomes really loose. Once it's as loose as you can sort of get it, you wanna get your Allen key and undo that screw to remove it. Now for this roller, I did actually need to take off the shroud for the hot end. And this is a great opportunity to look for any wire breaks and that we'll get to that later in the video. But I did need to take that off to get to the nut, which is actually a lock nut, awesome and then remove that. And then once that's done, you can remove the V-roller assembly. Once that's out, take your new V-roller and check to make sure they're the same. There is V-rollers on the market that are really crap. <laughs> and when you tension them up, they bind up. So make sure that they're actually a good quality replacement. And then you wanna put it back in place and reverse the procedure, making sure it actually can still spin when the screw is tight. And once it's in place, you then want to rotate the eccentric nut just to the point where the V-roller can't spin on its own. You don't want to over torque this and make it too tight, otherwise you're guaranteed to get flat spots on the soft plastic wheel, which will then definitely translate into issues and artifacts in your 3D print. So keep that in mind, a little bit at a time, making sure that it's tight enough, that there's no play in the mechanism, but not too tight that it's gonna instantly damage the plastic roller. Next, you wanna lubricate any of the motion components that need it. So again, the Ender 3 is mostly a V-roller approach, but it does have a single lead screw. If your machine has linear rods, this also needs to be kept lubricated to make sure that they don't make noise and they don't wear out too fast. 
So again, I like to use this new long grease. It's cheap, it's lasted me forever, uh, and it's quite sticky. Uh, a lot of people use oil, but I find it's quite thin. But the thing about this grease is you don't need much. So what I do is I hone the machine, and then I get a tiny amount of this grease and put it on the lead screw using just a screwdriver or zip tie or whatever you have on hand. And what you want to do is really only use about this much. It's really, it goes a long way. Any extra just gets squished out and pushed around the machine and then it'll start spreading on other components. So if you do this and then raise the gantry all the way up, keeping an eye on the grease and just pushing it back into the Acme threads as it goes, you'll get a really nice thin coating of grease that won't make a mess, but it means the machine will be nice and well lubricated. It helps reduce squeaking. It extends the lifespan of the lead screw and the Acme nut. And if you like, you can also add just a little bit of grease to the underside of that nut and then hone the machine again. And that way it's fully lubricated and it's gonna be great for a very, very long time. Now is the time to check over the machine and look for wire fatigue. Now this is a real problem because these wires are moving all the time and poor design without correct strain relief means that these wires will eventually break due to the constant flexing. And depending on which wire it is, they can cause all manner of issues. So now's a great time to look over the machine and make sure none of them are failing. On the end of three, the hot end cover just uses two M3 screws that it removes very easily. And you can really take a good look at the thermistor and the heat cartridge to make sure none of those wires look like they're about to fail. When I upgraded this machine with the direct drive hot end, there was a few wire mods I had to do and I didn't really do a great job, let's be real. So I'm gonna remove the existing zip ties and I'm gonna move the machine to its furthest point where the wires are stretched the most. And they're a little tight to my liking in this position, but this is just how long the wiring loom is now. And then I'll use some new zip ties to tighten the wires in place. So as the machine moves around, they don't flop about and at, are at risk of getting caught in other moving components. Along with the hot end, you wanna take a good look at the connections on the heat bed and the connections back to the control board. So it's very easy to access the control board on the end of three, there's just a few bolts to undo. And you wanna make sure none of them look charred. The hot end and heat bed connectors see an awful lot of amps and they can char and burn if they're inferior, which was a problem on a small batch of Ender 3 some time ago. The XT60 connectors used were crimped uh, incorrectly and used poorly, which meant they had very high resistance and would heat up while the actual heat bed was on and they would start to burn and char. So definitely check out that connector if you've got an older Ender 3. Check all your connections, make sure none of the wires look worn out or anything. And if they do, maybe consider fixing them. Unfortunately, on my machine, the LCD is showing some signs of damage. I don't know when this happened, maybe something fell on it, but this is probably isolated to the actual LCD module itself, not the connections. I tried unplugging and looking over the actual LCD plugs, but it does look like it's probably some of the silicon contact points in the LCD module itself. And if I try to fix it, I'll probably break it. It's still usable, so I'm gonna leave it here. But if you see something like this, where there's just some artifacting, it's probably in the module itself, not the actual cables back to the control board. A very well-known design flaw is this fan duct, which cools the control board. It's in a terrible position because if any 3D printing debris falls into it, it can easily jam up the fan and break blades and that sort of thing. So I wanted to design and print a little filter to go above it where if any filament fell onto it, it's less likely to fall into the fan blades. So I just use a really neat trick here where you can just print infill. And I printed this design with just infill, just two layers at 0.25 millimeter layer heights but the infill acts as a screen and I just printed that on the end of three and then put it in place above the fan. So now there's a really nice mesh that prevents any of the bigger debris from falling into the fan and possibly breaking blades or jamming it up, which could cause overheating issues to the control board. And finally, I need to tackle the terrible filament path on my Ender 3. I have the filament holder mounted to the side because it's where it's most accessible, where it lives in the shelves of the garage. But this means it runs a really bad path to the direct drive hot end upgrade, and it can sometimes jam up behind the filament holder and that causes all manner of problems. So I just went through my parts drawer and found this old little angle section that inserts into the B slot extrusion. And then in Fusion 360, I just designed this tiny little holder for the PTFE that slides over the angle and then you just secure the angle with a grub screw. And once this is in place, I just measured the maximum length the PTFE had to be, cut it down to size with a knife, and then you run the filament through. Now the PTFE is just a push fit. And again, this file's linked in the video description if you'd like to print one for yourself. And now isn't that just so much cleaner than it was before? It's fantastic. And here we have it. This is my Ender 3 after doing some basic maintenance on it. We've tightened the belts up. We've made sure there's no frayed or broken wires. I've added a few upgrades like this PTFE guide down to the direct drive 
upgraded hotend. And I don't know if you test prints, I'll overlay on the screen here what they look like. They are incredibly tight. It still blows my mind that a $200 US 3D printer like the Ender 3 can produce prints like this. And again, I've done a few upgrades, like I've got the easy peelsy bed, but latest Ender 3s come with a magnetic removable surface anyway. I've got the direct drive extruder, all this stuff will be linked in the video description below. But that's it, I haven't upgraded the control board, I haven't upgraded the motors or the drivers or anything. It's just pretty much stock beyond those two upgrades. And I've just done a few usability things like this PTFE guide. So if you have a 3D printer that's starting to look a little bit tired, the prints are starting to be a bit loose, a bit inaccurate, or you're worried about some safety aspects, I highly recommend just taking some time to take it out of your print farm and doing some basic maintenance like I've shown in this video. Now, I don't really do this sort of content on Maker's Muse. It's my aim here to empower creativity through technology, but I tend to do more 3D design and project-based videos. However, if you have an Ender 3 and you're looking to upgrade this thing to make it the best it can ever be, I highly recommend checking out Chuck's videos. He has done so many Ender 3 videos that have helped me directly get this machine up and running and perfect because when I first got this machine back in 2018, it did have some issues, especially with the PTFE couplers that it comes with from the factory, at least it did back then. And Chuck's videos really helped me get it back up and running then. So check out these videos, they're linked in the description below. And if you did enjoy this video and want to see more content on Maker's Muse, then maybe consider subscribing. Thanks for watching guys, bye.